And so in the, that part of this discussion about how does one synthesize on um, broad sweep different approaches to the American past or world past, she is the general editor of the American Historical Association's Guide to Historical Literature, Extraordinary Active Bibliographic Synthesis, as well as the textbook that she is co-authored, which is now in its ninth edition of People and a Nation. Eric Foner is the DeWitt Clinton Professor of History at Columbia University. His list of books would take half an hour just for me to read their different titles. They range from Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, back in 1970, to Tom Paine and Revolutionary America, Nothing But Freedom, his classic synthesis of Reconstruction, which has that as its main title, his Reader's Companion to American History, The Story of American Freedom, Who Owns Freedom, and most recently, The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery. He's also the author of a major textbook, Give Me Liberty, which has been published since 2004. Linda Gordon is the Florence Kelly Professor of History at NYU and the Humanities since 1998. Before that, she was a colleague of mine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, still much missed in our department. She's the author of Women's Body, Women's Right, the History of Birth Control in America, Heroes of Their Own Lives, The Histories and Politics, The History and Politics of Family Violence, the Great Arizona Orphan Abduction, and Dorothea Lang, most recently, A Life Without Limits. Again, I could keep going, but I'm going to stop with that so that there's some time for the panel to take place. I'm going to open by asking Mark Fiji to take no more than five minutes just to introduce the book and what he sought to accomplish in the book. I should hold the book up and wave it. <laughs> thanks, Bill, and thanks to everyone for coming to the session. The Republic of Nature originated in a class that would teach on American environmental history. Two students once asked me a straightforward question. Why did the subject matter in the class not include topics they imagined to be central to American history? The two specific examples they cited were the Revolution and the Civil War. I had to admit to them that their question had merit. I had built the course on some basic definitions of environmental history, including one offered by Donald Worcester. Environmental history, Worcester said, is about the role and place of nature in human life through time. I told my students that if Worcester's premise that nature had a role and a place in human life was correct, that it was reasonable, at least, to ask about the role and place of nature in events such as the Revolution or the Civil War. I told the students that I had no idea what those histories might look like. No one, to my knowledge, had attempted to write them, but I thought it could be done. One of my first decisions, one of my first decisions was to write a book that would be as interesting as I could make it for my students and for any other reader intrigued by the basic question. To that end, I chose not to write a single narrative that would attempt, textbook-like, to cover all of American history. In the spirit of my students' question, I decided to write a book that would focus on episodes, turning points, or major events about which many people knew something in which to then define the basic story of the United States. So I ended up with nine topics that run the gamut from early to modern, and that include colonial New England witchcraft, the Declaration of Independence, the expansion of cotton and slavery, the life of Abraham Lincoln, the Battle of Gettysburg, the construction of the first transcontinental railroad, the making of the atomic bomb, Brown v. Board of Education, and the 1973-1974 oil shock. Practical considerations influenced my choice of topics. As anyone who has worked on topics such as the Revolution or the Civil War knows, the literatures they have inspired are immense. It took me a long time to feel reasonably comfortable writing about them in chapters of only 40 or 50 pages in length. Opportunities also arose along the way. I did not originally envision a chapter on Lincoln. Only after I had the book in progress did I begin to think that his story had possibilities for what I was trying to do. Although my book asserts a strong point, that nothing in American history stands apart from its natural context, that all things have an environmental history, I avoided the claim that my work is definitive, that I have all the answers. I tried to write the book in the spirit of inquiry, in the spirit of proposing, suggesting, and asking. When the time came to write the conclusion, which I titled Paths That Beckon, I felt more comfortable with my approach. So I decided to offer the reader sketches or vignettes of nine additional topics. 
one of my students called them the bonus nine. And what they might look like as environmental history, the kinds of questions that might be asked as a means to further investigation. Some 14 or 15 years after I first imagined the Republic of Nature, 11 years after I began intensive work on it, it is now in the hands of readers. I look forward to the response. Well, I, I'm always everywhere. Um, 
panels because of witchcraft these days. Now, when I heard that Mark Ouija had included a chapter on witchcraft in a book on environmental history, I feared he was going to talk about ergot poisoning. <laughs> the notion that the afflicted girls of Salem were in effect high on an LSD-like drug when they made their accusations. I have to say that whenever I talk about Salem witchcraft, and I still do and to many audiences, academic and non-academic, inevitably the first question is about ergot poisoning. I'm glad to say that Mark did not do that. He wrote something else. He mentions the ergot poisoning theory only in a footnote that discusses my refutation of it. Yay, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do have to say one other thing, which is that every fall I have taken to teaching an undergraduate seminar on Salem witchcraft, and I offer the students who write the best papers the opportunity to publish their papers on the web. And I have to admit that two years ago, I had a student who was a senior in, guess what, plant pathology, who took the course so he could write about her gut poisoning, who actually wrote what I think is the best possible argument for the presence of ergot poisoning in Salem in the, seven, in the time of the witchcraft. So if you ever want to read this paper, which I promote to your attention, just Google Cornell Witchcraft Collection. Look for the tab that says Student Research, and I have posted the best papers from my class there. There are also other good papers, but that's the one that's relevant to this session. So he's by a guy named Joseph Fetterly, who was a farm kid from New York taking plant pathology, but also took my course in Salem Witchcraft. Now, Mark's attention to environmental stresses on people and animals, that's what he does talk about in the chapter, um, that affected all of northern New England in the 1690s doesn't actually tell us very much about why the crisis erupted in Salem Village or why it spread throughout Essex County, but not elsewhere, with just a very few exceptions in nearby counties. Few scholars today pay too much, pay much attention to the concurrent and abortive witchcraft crisis around Fairfield, Connecticut, at exactly the same time, that is, in the summer, in the summer of 1692, spring, summer, fall of 1692. I discuss it, as John Demos does in part, and so does Richard Godbeer in a, in a little book, literally a little book, short, small book, entitled Escaping Salem. Events there started off as they did in Salem Village, with a young woman having fits and accusing other women of afflicting her. But in Connecticut, as Mark knows, because he cites Godbeer's book in a footnote, or two, after a handful of prosecutions that ended in acquittals, at least, or at least not in convictions, so in any case, I won't bore you with the details about, it failed to develop further. Now, presumably, the Connecticut environment was no less stressed than Essex counties, so Mark's approach doesn't help us to understand the discrepancy. What does, I argue here, and I argued in my book, In the Devil's Snare, is that Connecticut was far less threatened with Indian attacks than was Essex County. Now, I might add here that Mark does not ignore or counter my argument. He's not saying I'm wrong. He just rel he relies on it as part of his overall interpretation. But I do want to go beyond that point and think somewhat more broadly about Mark's hypothesis, which builds on our chair Bill Cronin's insight decade ago that animal crowding helped to drive the expansion of New England settlements. And on Virginia Anderson's stunning Creatures of Empire, how domestic animals transformed early America, which I commend the attention of everyone here if you haven't yet read it. Mark's discussion made me think about the omnipresence of animals in the Salem witchcraft records. And that brought home to me the fact that the people of Essex County clearly lived in much closer proximity to animals than we do today, except for pets, like cats and dogs. <coughs> Now, although Mark, in his book, does not categorize them specifically, there are three different sorts of, of references to animals that appear in the Salem records. First, livestock suffering illnesses or strange accidents, and usually dying as a result of those. Those are harms that are attributed to witchcraft by the people to whom the animals belonged. But not all such instances they actually date from 1692. In fact, many occurred years later. But years earlier, sorry, years earlier, but were merely reported to the court in 1692. So the reports that he used cannot, you, he cannot be used to suggest any particular animal illnesses in 1692. So one of the points of his argument is there's 
a lot of animal illness around. It's true there are lots of ill animals reported in the Salem records, but a lot of those reports are from 5, 10, 15 years earlier. So even though they reported in 1692, they're not there in 1692. So there's no actual evidence that there was greater animal illness in 1692 than there had been at previous times. <laughs> Then secondly, there are spectral, often shape-shifting animals that did strange things like climbing down chimneys, passing through closed doors, and frightening horses. And I'm happy to say that my own ninth great-grandmother did that, uh, Mary Bradbury, who was convicted as a Salem witch. I always tell my students when they take my class that they're taking a course from the descendant of a Salem witch. Um, anyway, she, she turned herself into a spectral blue boar, according to the testimony, and caused an enemy's horse to throw him off to the ground, which is exactly what he deserved, because after what he'd been saying about her. <laughs> now, third, there are animal familiars, and that is creatures who were believed to carry the devil's communications to the witches. In the Salem records, such animal familiars were more likely to be spectral than real, and more likely to be birds, especially yellow birds, uh, or cats than any other animals, or so concluded one of my students in this course in a term paper that she wrote a couple of years ago where she categorized all the references to animals in the, um, in the records. Now, in thinking about this last category, the category of animal familiars, in connection to other witchcraft scholarship, Something I had really not done before reading Mark's book, so thanks again, Mark. Um, I was struck by a difference between the Essex County, Massachusetts witchcraft crisis and that of Essex County, England, a half century earlier, as reported in Malcolm Gaskell's excellent book, Witch Fighters. There, the reported animal familiars were more likely to be real little creatures, not spectral ones. They were likely to be mice, rats, or the like. And they weren't spectral birds. So I am led to speculate, and this is a total speculation, first that rodents overran more houses in Essex County, England than they did in Essex County, New England, and second that bird life might have been more in decline in agricultural England than in less settled America. Just a speculation, but it's perhaps a point for environmental historians to contemplate. Now I want to end with a different sort of observation. Although I've been critical of Mark's book and his commentary, I underscore the point that I found it very provocative, as my remarks on his discussion of witchcraft and animals should indicate. When I finished reading the book, though, I found myself wishing that one of his chapters had placed gender at the forefront of his analysis, because I would have liked to have seen what he did with such a topic. It's not that he wholly ignores gender or women in the book. They do turn up in various chapters. Abigail Adams appears in the discussion of natural law in the 18th century. The women of Topeka are very much present in the discussion of Brown v. Board of Education. The wives of the Los Alamos scientists are certainly there. And perhaps most notably, the housewives of the feminine mystique play a role when he cons considers the oil and gasoline crisis of 1973-74, uh, along with the women's relationship to the suburbs and the interstate highway system. But in no chapter of the book are women central. So I started to think about possible topics focusing on gender that could be examined, employing Mark Fiji's environmental framework. The one that most appealed to me might perhaps have to do with my long residence in upstate New York. Um, but I also think it would fit well into his framework. That is, the Seneca Falls Convention of, 18, of 1848. Why was the first women's rights convention in the history of the world held there in what is today a small backwater village? So small and so backwater, in fact, that last year the village voted to dissolve itself to save money. <laughs> now there's a town of Seneca Falls, but there is no village of Seneca Falls. The answer, of course, lies in part in the Erie Canal. Seneca Falls was sited directly on it. The resulting state of business was why Henry Stanton located his law office there, and the ease of travel on the canal was why Quakers, including Lucretia Mott, who organized the convention of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, were planning to have a large meeting nearby. But Seneca Falls also lies in the upstate environment of frontier religious ferment during the preceding two decades that led people in the region to think differently, and that in quotes, and which also spawned Joseph Smith and the Mormons, as well as a major component of the Second Great Awakening. So much so that, as everyone here knows, the region became known as the Burned Over District because of the fires of repeated revivals. So I freely offer that idea to Mark or to anyone else in the audience who wants to follow in his footsteps and take on a similar challenge.
want to come forward, there are plenty of seats up here. Eric Foner is our next commentator. Interestingly, of human muscle power replacing 
other forms of propulsion. Uh, he moves from that somehow seamlessly to the universal law of entropy, the inexorable dissipation of thermodynamic energy, which dictates the decline of um, hydrocarbon energy, he says, and one might add, according to TV nature shows, which I remember watch, <laughs> the eventual end of the universe, hundreds of billions of years from now, as the law of entropy just leads to everything disappearing. But the, my point is the juxtaposition here of these levels of analysis from the human body to the universal laws of energy seem rather disconcerting or confusing. Fortunately, the individual chapters are much more, as it were, down to earth, and they offer fascinating and valuable insights. Fiji, as you heard, uh, links the Salem witchcraft crisis with the colonists' troubled relationship to nature to the land, animals, diseases, and Native Americans. Remember, people are part of nature, so Native Americans are too. <coughs> Belief in supernatural forces helped them to explain their inability, this is the colonists, inability to reconstruct or even understand natural developments. In the end, however, the interpretation essentially seems to fall back on psychology, what he calls the unstable social and environmental bases of colonial society produced a series of, quote, stresses and fears that led to the witchcraft disaster. This is hardly a new interpretation. And since, as he acknowledges, Salem was not alone in confronting these challenges, it's difficult to explain why the crisis broke out there and not in other towns. The discussion of the revolutionary era suffers, I think, from a conflation of belief in natural law with environmental history. Fiji offers an excellent discussion of the meaning of natural rights as espoused in the Declaration of Independence um, and of the invocation of nature to explain the support, uh, subordinate position of women, but these are pretty familiar discussions. More concrete and interesting, I think, is this discussion of how nature complicated the designs of Thomas Jefferson, who at Monticello um, attempted to impose symmetry on a very irregular topography requiring a giant effort to reshape the physical environment that never quite succeeded. In his first book, Irrigated Eden, uh, Fiji showed how man's conquest of nature is never complete. Nature seems to always fight back against efforts to control it. Jefferson, too, found his best efforts stymied by the constraints of nature. I found particularly valuable Fiji's discussion of the cotton kingdom of the Old South, he explains how the physical requirements of the cotton plant and its crop cycle from planting and germination to harvest shape the nature of settlement and cultivation and even encourage certain forms of slave resistance. Dealing with unwanted vegetation, that's what people like me call weeds, <laughs> emerged as a continual kind of struggle between master and slave. Uh, moreover, the physical nature of slaves' bodies made the total efficiency demanded by owners impossible, since their diets of corn and pork offered insufficient nourishment for constant work. Slaves had to supplement their diets from livestock and garden plots of their own, leading to further conflict over time and work. Here, nature emerges as a key element in a familiar story. But what is absent is as important as the new insights. Fiji says nothing about ideology, master or slave, about slave culture, about the world market in cotton, about the credit system. In other words, the wider world has slipped out of view, making it impossible to assess the importance of the factors that he emphasizes. I was particularly interested in Fiji's discussion of Abraham Lincoln, and especially his emphasis on Lincoln's 1850s speech on discoveries and, and inventions. One of Lincoln's favorites, but one that always seemed to bore his audiences when he delivered it. You know, Lincoln made money giving speeches, and the uh, Lyceum people say, Lincoln, come up here and give a speech, like in Milwaukee. And Lincoln would say, oh, I have this great speech on discoveries. And they said, no, we don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's a really boring speech. So, but nonetheless, we didn't really like it. Nature, Lincoln spoke frequently about nature within a developmental outlook. Nature was there to be conquered. This is Fiji's argument, which is interesting. Having grown up on the frontier, Lincoln disliked physical toil, 
improvement, new technology, better transportation would reduce the need for such toil, producing abundance for all in a free labor society. Fiji makes the point that Lincoln experienced the American landscape directly as a settler and boatman and surveyor, and that he traveled extensively in the nation's heartland before becoming president. He saw the physical unity of the country as underpinning its political unity. All this is insightful, but when the discussion then turns to the road to emancipation, the narrative again becomes familiar and the nature actually seems to disappear from the story. Again, when the discussion becomes more concrete in his account of the Battle of Gettysburg, the invocation of nature is more persuasive. Everybody knows about the fields, ridges, and dens that make up the battlefield, but Fiji describes the topography in vivid detail and demonstrates, as he writes, that, quote, the terrain is never neutral, that it affected in different ways the strategies of both sides in the battle. Then he goes on to the Transcontinental Railroad and then makes a giant leap to the building of the atomic bomb in the early 1940s, certainly one of the most dramatic efforts to harness the power of nature. Fiji emphasizes how many of the atomic scientists of Los Alamos, such as J. Robert Oppenheimer, loved the region's mountains and forests. One reason they didn't, be, they didn't mind being holed up in such a remote place was the beauty of nature. But other than a compelling irony, that is, people who love nature using its awe-inspiring power to destroy, the point is not entirely clear. What does it matter that they love nature while they're working on the atomic bomb? Um, and the book then, as you heard, goes through an interesting discussion of Linda Brown and the origins of Brown v. Board of Ed case, and then moves finally to the oil crisis of the 1970s, offering a very interesting account of where oil comes from and how its intensive use has reshaped the American environment and our social outlook. In the final chapter, Fiji looks briefly at a few other moments in American history, mostly, mostly through questions, some interesting, others quixotic, I think. Here, the discussion becomes more reductionist than the rest of the book. Can Reconstruction really be, quote, explained as environmental history? Fiji notes that access to common land and the right to hunt and ownership of dogs were one side of struggle uh, during Reconstruction. But these were hardly the central questions of the titanic battles of that era. Then, later seeking to find a link between modern feminism and environmentalism, he asked, did Betty's Prudan suburban women also experience the spraying of their homes with DDT? I don't quite frankly think they probably did. But, I don't, but more important, I don't think that this such a question really offers a foretaste of a new interpretation of the social movements of that era. But overall, my first piece of advice to those in this room, nearly all of you not yet having seen this book, of course, is to go out and read it. You will be enlightened, entertained, and fascinated. You may also wish that Professor Fiji had offered less in the way of familiar narratives of events and been more precise as to what exactly he's claiming about the role of nature in explaining some of the key episodes of our history. But any pioneering work is probably going to be open to similar criticisms. And in the end, I congratulate him for producing a book that anyone interested in the American past will have to reckon with. environmental questions, along with other questions about vast range of et cetera, should be asked in all historical analysis. Uh, this is not a determinist argument. He's not claiming that environmental matters are always a major cause or consequence, but that no single factor is ever always that. Uh, and I think this is a challenge very well placed. Furthermore, he could have made his argument uh, much more easily by cherry-picking his case studies from among events 
that were closely related to known environmental concerns, such as dam building or the dust bowl. Or he could have confined himself to the region and time period he knows best, but he created a challenge to himself by choosing to cover, as Eric just explained, American history from very early on to very recently, and to pick out events such as Brown versus the Board of Education, um, which do not appear to relate to the environment. Furthermore, he does work, I think, with a sophisticated notion of nature as a concept that includes human beings. Now, there are problems with that definition, and they're not problems of Marx. Uh, they're problems because that capacious conception of nature leaves then very little that is not nature, and to write nature so broadly leaves us with very little focus. But happily, I think in much of the book, he reverts to a kind of vernacular, uh, popular understanding of what nature is. Um, my favorite chapter is the one about building the transcontinental railroads. I cannot tell you what's original in it, as in any of this, because I don't know the field, but the story is great. The lay of the land, the geographical environment, exerted major constraints on the routes of both the eastward and the westward uh, train building. Some of these constraints were positive, offering valleys uh, along which to thread uh, the rails. Others were negative. The very most beautiful sites, the Rocky and the Sierra Nevada uh, mountains, uh, required complex predictions from the surveyors, not only about tunneling, but about things that I would never have thought of, such as how high are the snow banks likely to be in this particular location? How much of an incline, either up or down grading, can we, uh, we handle over a shorter period? Uh, I found myself thinking of his description of the railroad's relation to the environment as a series of concentric ovals. The, uh, the smallest one just outside the rails themselves were the nearby supplies which were needed in astronomical, unimaginable quantities. Wood for the ties, but not all kinds of wood would yield serviceable uh, uh, ties. They learned from experience. Red wood worked well, supplying 135,000 ties at a rate of 2,500 per mile. Pine, tamarack, cedar, and fir also worked, but cottonwood did not because it was moist and soft held the spikes only tenuously. Um, other trees had to be used to supply the Central Pacific's wood-burning locomotive, which was coming from the east. The railroad builders simply cut the <coughs> trees they wanted from the settlers and squatters' lands. They employed hunters who did their share killing bison. They trailed cattle herds behind construction to feed the advancing workers. But soon, the nature adjacent to the railroad was used up, and furthermore, other supplies were needed that were not found nearby, so that the material cost of the railroads was literally global. They were soon importing trees from the upper Midwest, which were sent to lumber, mar lumber, lumber yards in Chicago and then shipped the west. Iron came from Pennsylvania, transported by wagons and mills, then to glass furnaces, then to rolling mills, finally shaped into rails. Huge amounts of food came in to feed the workers, and I mean not only human, but also animal workers, uh, not to mention tobacco, coffee, tea, alcohol, and opium. The Chinese, who uh, were a very substantial number of the builders of the railroads, did not like the monotonous Western American diet of flour, cornmeal, potatoes, meat, and beans. They insisted on having rice, fish, mushrooms, and dried seaweed and bamboo shoots. And these were supplied, which I, this is parenthetically, not from Mark's book, I thought is a very uh, surprising example of workers' power that they managed to get this food imported. How was all this material transported? Often by horse-drawn wagons and mule trains. Uh, I found this a wonderful image. Again, it's my image, it's not Mark's, because it encapsulates something very important about the history of industrialization, that building the great machine, in this case the railroads, was done by using animal power that this great machine would then make obsolete. 
This is the only chapter in which he discusses human labor as part of nature. And here I think he misses some important lines of analysis. The human labor would not ever become obsolete, whether indeed not the minerals, cutting the trees, or growing the food. Moreover, the nature of the human labor was constrained by the politics, in which were the politics of slavery in this case. The federal government saw the railroad as part, which was originally conceived uh, during the Civil War, as part of the need to connect up and solidify the Union and prevent the West from sliding into a Confederate alliance so that a possible southern route for this transcontinental railroad was uh, vetoed. Had a southern route proceeded, much would have been different, including the fact that the laborers might have been African Americans, <coughs> possibly even slaves, which would have moved many thousands of African Americans westward before that actually happened in American history. Uh, and another missed line of analysis was uh, the environmental consequences of the railroad's just absolutely bottomless appetite for wood, iron, and feed. A chapter on the 1973 oil crisis uh, provides more opportunity for a most wonderful story chapter. But here, too, I wanted the analysis to go further in several directions, both deeper into the characteristics of oil and, and also into what economists call externalities and the uh, impact of all this on shifting global balance of power. Just to remind you of the setting, the United States' decision to supply the Israeli military during the Yom Kippur War of 1973 led the 12 oil producing companies of OPEC um, to uh, create an, arms, uh, an oil market. The resulting shortages produced major effects in the U.S. And Fee re relates them very colorfully. I'm not going to mention them now, but they include, I mention all of them, the suburbs, the great mobility of youth, the highways, and furthermore, in a consequence that's interestingly not, not pointed out, the ultimate decline of the railroads whose rise he previously traced. This shortage of oil produced higher prices, which put a bigger burden on the poor and on those whose livelihood depended on long commutes, long lines of gas stations, which created anger, robberies, violence, uh, rationing, uh, the promotion of car rules. Above all, he argues, the crisis produced a political conviction that our dependence on foreign oil was a danger. So, that accelerated drilling, which resulted as a part of this conviction that we shouldn't be dependent on foreign oil, produced yet further environmental disasters. What I found missing to start with was a surprising lack of inquiry into the material nature of oil itself, the oiliness of oil, and the consequences of that nature. Unlike coal or wood, oil is somewhat liquid and can be transported through pipes, under mountains and water, over sand desert, deserts. It creates new kinds of vulnerability to disruption, but also new kinds of power to oil producers who can simply turn off the tap, as we've seen in repeated places then. It is the oiliness of oil that makes it lethal in a way that coal and wood were not. A barge that capsized and dumped its coal would produce consequences far more benign than a tanker that leaks its oil. Oil kills. It kills both fauna and flora. It destroys human livelihoods. It defaces the nature we like to call beauty. Uh, what is lost is, is not just the price of the so-called cleanup, but also some damages that may not be amenable ever to cleanup. These are these are the actual costs of oil production. This is what economists, refer, or certain groups of economists, refer to as externalities. And they are not usually calculated, or not usually included at, in the calculation of the actual price of oil. Furthermore, the geopolitics of oil then shapes U.S. foreign policy in, in a, a very major way. The chapter about the Solomons begins with an extremely surprising anecdote. Uh, as far as I know, it's original. But it seems that the wife of Edward Teller, who was one of the major physicists, organized a group of women 
to sit down in front of a bulldozer that was preparing to mow down some pine trees in this beautiful location of the future settlement of Los Alamos in the Hemis Mountains of Mexico. Now, I find that an extraordinary little newsflash, and I expected the chapter to follow up what happened, whether there was some kind of an environmental struggle, but to my surprise, it's completely dropped and not mentioned later. Uh, the chapter, I think, makes actually an elegant connection, and this is why I slightly disagree with Eric, between the bomb builders' aesthetic appreciation of their environment and their aesthetic appreciation of the beauty of the physics of the fission that they were creating. Although it's true that we don't learn what are, what are the consequences of this. But uh, there are more serious, I think, absences uh, in this chapter that I do feel I have to uh, comment on. First, Phoebe is quite clear that many of the workers had a lot of doubts about the bomb. And this is not only after uh, the, the two bombs were dropped in Japan, but even before, after the El Gordo test. Uh, their doubts arose both from the sheer scope of the explosion, but after time, of course, came to focus on the civilian casualties. But Mark never challenges these workers' assumption that the bomb was necessary to finish off Japan, despite the work of many diplomatic historians who show that the bomb was dropped not to defeat Japan, but as a threat, as a shot across the bow to the Soviet Union. This crucial fact, along with the Soviet discovery of the U.S. map showing 40 Soviet cities to be targeted in an atomic attack, is what made the Soviets convinced that they needed to build a nuclear bomb as fast as they possibly could. This, then this leads to a second omission, and that is the failure to discuss the distant costs of the building of the bomb, not at Los Alamos, but at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they manufactured the uranium, and at the Hanford, Washington plant, where they manufactured the plutonium. And in this story, uh, ironically, the American experience frighteningly parallels almost exactly the Soviet experience, which came just a little bit later since they were building their bomb post-war. Uh, both countries feeling urgent in this bomb building, sacrificed safety. Um, the, yet there's no discussion of the serious environmental, and that includes human consequences in both countries. And let me only mention here, for obvious reasons, the American story. Hanf the Hanford plant refused for many years to even allow a study of the environment. When they were finally forced to do so, they hired for the job a firm that was one of the major contractors at Hanford. That firm, unsurprisingly, announced that there was no significant environmental impact, which is just exactly what happened in Chelyabinsk in the Soviet Union. Much later, the facts came out. By 1959, the Hanford plant had been releasing 20,300 curies a day into the Columbia River totaling 200 million trees, released 140 million radionuclides in the air. The radioactivity of plankton and algae increased as you went downstream in the Columbia, and the fish multiplied the amount of radioactivity that was in what they ate, and the vegetables in, grown in the soil around there were the same, and it turned out that when the vegetables were boiled, their radioactivity increased. And you could, I'm not going to read, you continue this story as we go up the food chain. Um, there used to be a requirement of scholarly historical journals that only those who have published books should review books. Um, I'm glad that rule was abolished, but it had a point, uh, which is that only those who worked through the agonies of building a coherent manuscript would have the humility to review others. I, I feel like this point is multiplied when one is reviewing a book that selects cases from the entire span of American history. I have nothing but respect for uh, Mark's work in building this book, and I hope others will have the courage to build on it. I learned a great deal from it, and I can promise you that you will too if you read it. Thanks.
audience, I'll invite Mark to the podium to respond to the comments of the ways that he sees fit.
The titles of these books alone are richly suggestive. Mastered by the Clock, Born in Bondage, Working Cures, Bathed in Blood, Closer to Freedom, Sugar Masters, Swing the Sickle for the Harvest is Ripe, Joining Places, Working the Diaspora, and the like. What is, no less the, what is no less interesting about this trend is that environmental historians themselves seem to be missing it. Perhaps we have defined the boundaries of our field too narrowly and we are missing a convergent movement among other scholars, a convergent movement that ought to interest us and that might allow us to read Mark Stewart's What Nature Suffers to Grow, for example, a classic in our field against a broader <coughs> array of scholarship. There are yet more examples of the kind of thing I'm talking about race and civil rights, for example, or state formation, but let me focus briefly on one more, and that is the Civil War. There is a growing number of environmental historians who have taken an interest in the conflict. Lisa Brady's War Upon the Land, just released, comes to mind. At the same time, there appears to be a convergent movement among some Civil War historians to rise above the endless battle of histories to point to the larger structures and material circumstances in which those battles took place. The focus of these historians' work is logistics, <coughs> technical military term for material systems of supply, precisely the kinds of subjects of interest to environmental historians. With these and other areas of convergence in mind, I look forward to working with historians of all kinds to develop a deeper understanding of American history. If the Republic of Nature in any way can bring scholars together, to talk and debate and assist in the project of building a scholarly community around issues of concern to many of us now, I will consider the book to have been a success. Thank you.